Thank, thank you very much, Sila, and, and to, the, to the, um, the other speakers for this, um, for this really enlightening session. Um, I believe we now have time, we, we, we've got a panel discussion, is that correct, Rebecca? I just chatted to Flo and she said we can go till late tonight. No, I'm just, I'm, jo I'm joking. Uh, look, I think we, 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 I'm loath to break and have people come back because I suspect, um, yeah. So let, let's just run a, run a session now and, and see if people have questions and, yeah. and go from there, yeah? So I appreciate your, uh, your, your stickability, your tenacity. Please do start thinking about questions. We're just going to have a little chat between ourselves. I've got some questions for the panellists, but then please, after that, put your hands up. Um, we're just going to get straight into it. First of all, um, Sila and Amy, I wanted to ask about what level of awareness there is amongst your communities about sea level rise and particularly any connection to Antarctica and that awareness. Uh, living at the bottom of New Zealand in a coastal town um, and we are traditional harvesters of mutton birding, sea level rise has um, been at the forefront of our minds. Um, in our sites for a very long time. Um, mutton birds have been a key indicator of the environment and, and climate change. Um, yes, very, very aware. Um, through the project of Te Taiuka up here, we've extended the curiosity and interests of our people to think further than our mutton bird islands and the subantarctics. Um, so using the mutton birds again as an example, um, you know, what happens to the plankton impacts the mutton birds and therefore impacts our ability to harvest our cultural food. Um, and also in our coastal region, uh, we've got forecasts of um, when Bluff will become an island. Um, I think that will be an amazing point in time. But it also, um, uh, you know, these impacts on uh, seaweeds and our ability to harvest kai from around our coast as well. And also, yeah, our, how we live and where we live. In all honesty, um, a lot of the... Uh, talk around sea level rise for us in the Arctic has been about Greenland ice sheet and how that's impacting on small island developing states and so on. And in fact, we have worked closely with many, uh, uh, a program called Many Strong Voices in the past, uh, going to some of these COP meetings with other fellow indigenous peoples from the small island developing states. But um, other than that, we don't get a lot of that kind of language or knowledge about how the melt of Antarctica ice sheet is impacting on the sea level rise in the Arctic. That, that's just something that's rather uh, new for me, you know, in terms of, of, of that. And certainly, um, I would like to know more about that. Thank you. And Rob, I wanted to ask you, you've got a background as a, a fiction writer as well as investigative journalist, so that's two different modes of writing, um, perhaps for different audiences. Do you have a sense about which is most effective or impactful in what context that you'd like to talk about? Um, well, I, I think the elements of writing across... Um, Boundaries in that regard, uh, I think it's incumbent on everyone to be a bit more aware of using plain, vivid language um, so that you don't have to have a doctorate to read um, a publicly funded um, research paper. 
uh, there was these revolutions in the legal community. Why can't it happen in science? So it's, I, I try to make an effort with my own writing to um, use straightforward language um, to, to also to um, tell stories um, in, a, in a meaningful way. Now, uh, journalism, investigative journalism, co comes with it these ideas that you're somehow, um, you're not um, subject to the, the pressures of, 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 of uh, form. Um, but I think in many ways, investigative journalists are, are just as guilty, if not more guilty, than, as, than fiction writers in terms of trying to tell a story that's, that's grabbing headlines. And it just turns the public off. Um, so I, I think for, as a fiction writer, you get more leeway. Um, and um, I enjoy the, uh, the breadth and the generosity of, of fiction um, that, that fiction allows. Um, and I can sneak in a lot more of sort of my own sort of views about the way that, um, that life, life's, as you're talking about trauma, that people are, spiritual trauma that I think are, are, are very real, um, even if people wouldn't say it that way. I think that's, a, that's an essential aspect of storytelling as it speaks to that kind of, that wound. Yeah. Thank you. We've got some questions, I think, first here. Yeah. You spoke about humanizing the polar regions in various ways. Um, and there was the element of bringing head and heart together. That, that's essential in, in very personal ways. I wonder if maybe each and one of you would be willing to give one, one thing to keep in mind for us as scientists if we want to learn from that. I, I can say something briefly. Um, I, I've learned as a writer, a, a science writer with a science background, that I used to write in, you know, a sort of objective, interesting way about the cool science that was happening in Antarctica. And after a while, I found that this was just a really dishonest way to be writing. And so I began writing a lot more long form, um, longer books, essays, articles, where I was able to not just put the process of science in there, but put my my really um, honest anxieties about what was happening and the sort of futures that these scientists were talking about as possibilities and, and was able to get them talking about their anxieties and concerns about the future and future generations as well. And the feedback that I've got is that people found that really impactful, it really, they found it really engaging and they really appreciated the honesty. So. Don't make people anxious. The goal is not to make people freak out and be anxious, but I think bringing your whole self to your communication and being honest about who you are, what your concerns are, maybe what you're doing in your personal life to respond to the climate crisis can all be good things in the right context. Yeah, I th I th is it on? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I think so. Don't be afraid to share your own stories your own storytelling, your own apprehensions, your own worries, um, but not in a way to make people fearful, but to share that we're all in this together on common ground. Because oftentimes I think we can have that kind of facade of strength, you know, if we just work with this and it's not so, it's not so, um, it, it, it's safer. You can you can act uh, you you can you can move forward in spaces that are, that don't feel safe. It doesn't mean they won't be safe. Is what I'm trying to say. Share uh, like the book that I wrote. It's it's really about my life's work, but it's it's a memoir about my life. Period, as it relates to all of those journeys that I've been on trying to do this work, and so I really did put myself out there, but I did it as a way to share not just my own personal journey. But I come from a, a culture that is struggling deeply, emotionally, spiritually, ripped apart by colonialism and by historical traumas. And I wanted that generation that is taking their lives in numbers well above any other place in the world, in North America, to, to understand that there's a historical context to the struggles that we face so that they don't carry that burden as a personal one. 
that there is some historical context to why we struggle in our communities and why we need them to become championers, that next generation, in protecting the environment for all of us. And so to personalize your writing, your research, and let, allow yourself to feel what it is that you're researching upon and writing upon. And I think that's going to be helpful in the way things shift, you know? It's, it's a slow process, but it starts with us, as I say, personal transformation. Yeah. Um, I'd just add to that that if you ever got the opportunity to engage with and interact with communities that are explicitly affected by yes. um, climate change and sea level rise, etc., do that. You know, listening to them, um, experiencing uh, their livelihoods, etc., is really quite powerful. Um, and I think you'll see your place in your research and how that links all of your research, by the way, it actually does link to all of the challenges that we face at a community level and at a family level. So if you ever have the opportunity to do that, or if, would you, if you'd like to do science projects in Bluff, you're welcome to come. Yeah, and I'll just add um, a very simple uh, trick. Um, there's a technique um, in, in writing that is the moves from passive voice to active voice. Almost every poster I've read, every piece of science writing I've read is all in passive voice. A longitudinal study was done uh, on ice sheet analysis. Where's the author? Where's the I? Um, it seems like there's, a, there's this convention to remove the individual who's writing the document. Mm. So there's immediately a wall between the reader and the author. It's, it's, it's impregnable. So how to humanize is very simple directly use I and an active voice, even if it seems to break the conventions of your publication. It goes a long way. This has been just, today's just been really a, a wonderful set of talks and I really have enjoyed um, this crossing disciplines. And this is probably a more broad question, so there might be others in the room that can also address this. but. Something that was brought up this morning was that we need to change our educational system because there's this real disconnect and divide between the physical scientists and the social scientists and the policymakers. And for those of us that are thinking about ways to attract more students, um, for instance, there's a lot of problems with decreasing numbers of enrollment in geosciences. So we're trying to think of ways to attract more people but can we do that by broadening what we're trying to teach and maybe have something that's more transdisciplinary where they're getting a broader education in the physical sciences, but also social sciences and policy and then can focus on, on different things. And I'm wondering if any of you have some thoughts um, being some of you from a physical science background, but then exploring more on the humanities side and how we might be able to embrace that and who to work with and if anybody has um, done this at their institutions, I'd be really interested in hearing about that. Thanks. I, I can speak to that. So I'm um, co a co-founder of a school of science and society at my institution, and the two of us who co-founded it both came from a science background, but had then moved on from that. So we're an interdisciplinary school, and we teach a bit of science, but but really we're looking at science in its social, political, historical context and also teach science communication. And it's, it's going really well. And um, if you email me, I can send you links and, and share curriculums and things like that. But there, there are not a lot of those sorts of units around, but there, there are some. And um, student demand has been really good. And yeah, the students who come out and then are doing masters and PhDs are doing really amazing work. Um, Rob, over here. So I work for a science journal where we force the authors to have a, a sentence that says, here we show. So we're at least trying to make progress in that. But my, my question relates to a book by Matt Bell called Appleseed. It's told in, uh, in three acts. The first is sort of the, the unwitting destruction of the natural world by humanity. Act two is the failure of geoengineering to fix the world. Act three is sort of in an ice house climate where Antarctica has taken over the entire world. 
but it, it ends with essentially like a note of hope that in spite of all that humanity has done, there's still hope in the end. And it makes me think about sort of the cycles of hothouse to ice house climates that we've seen many times in the planetary history and the idea of rebirth after um, catastrophe, potentially even though humans might not be, be responsible for doing that. And I'm really curious about your thoughts about the role of, of literature, science fiction, to either give people a false hope that it's going to be all, all OK in the end, or just to not succumb to doomerism. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, some of the talks, to be fair, in, in this conference were, were, were excellently um, oriented towards broadening um, interest, even in, within a specialty audience like this. With Jeremy's talk, for instance, when he pulled up the bell hooks uh, uh, quote, um, I think the quote was something like, the function of art is to do more than tell it is, is to um, imagine what could be possible. And he crossed out the art and he put science. So um, it's things like that. We've, we've talked a bit about imagination today. Um, and narratives do tend to be doom-oriented narratives when it comes to the climate. And it's impossible for me to tell um, whether or not that has an impact, but it probably... Um, uh, has a, is a, if there's a glut in any kind of one finish, one, one kind of um, end state, uh, it's, it's now in that almost every piece of, of climate fiction has this, um, has this doomsday scenario. And, and again, it's, I'm not, not arguing with its, with its general premise. It's probably um, we're heading in, 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 in bad ways. But at the same time, just as storytellers, as, um, I would look to poetry. Um, people like Gary Snyder, who've been, who's still alive, by the way, this, uh, this uh, beat poet, he's probably 93, living off off grid in California. He's been writing about these matters for uh, 70 years. And his poetry is, um, especially Turtle Island, it won the Pulitzer Prize in 1975. You're talking about a beat poet who's been banging the drum. And his poetry isn't doom and gloom. Even though he puts doom and gloom inside of almost every line, it seems that there's a lift somehow. And I think that energizes. There's something about that, that lift at the end of any piece of writing, whether it be nonfiction or poetry or prose. There's just that little bit of a movement upwards. Um, and it, it just leaves people a little bit more inspired rather than def deflated. I think Rebecca was speaking a little bit about that too. And you know, maybe the difference between indifference and anger. Uh, but there's also a big difference between indifference and, and, and excitement, or indifference and passion, indifference and anything, really. <laughs> indifference is the worst. So any kind of writing that moves us past this, this sort of horrible grayness is, is, the, is the one thing I'd, I'd, I'd emphasize. One of the things I just want to share that I didn't, um, because of the time, is that as much as we are having enormous struggles in the Arctic, especially with our, our youth population and the suicide rates, um, there is a parallel process happening as well to some of the the older, perhaps I would say older, in their 30s, uh, 40s, where they're becoming ambassadors for the Arctic in terms of fashion design. Uh, just days ago, uh, an Inuk fashion designer was on the runways of New York with all Inuit young women as the models. Um, documentary filmmakers, are making huge waves right now from the Inuit world and, cre and creating awareness through that movie making. If you haven't seen a documentary called Angry Inuk by Alethea, it's a powerful, powerful documentary. Um, if you haven't seen The Grizzlies, which is a movie um, on Inuit kids from uh, on suicide issues, it's a powerful movie. Uh, jewelry making, filmmaking, authors, you know, there is this movement happening. Um, I have a daughter who is a throat singer, drum dancer, who is continuing since she was 17 to bring back all of these incredible ways in which spirit can be built back up. And there are many others that are doing that through performing arts around the world. And so I'm not suggesting that it's all just dark up there in terms of our youth, but at the same time, those numbers are still there and they're very high. I mean, I just lost another grand nephew just three, four weeks ago to suicide. Um, and that's not the first in our community. There's many. 
but there is this movement as well. And it's all about protecting culture. It's all about for the love of culture, the songs, the, 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 the creative way in which this group of people uh, in our communities from right across Alaska, Greenland, Canada, and, and Russia a, a little bit less now because now they've kind of been pushed away from our international body once again due to the leaderships uh, that are going on up there. Um, but there is some remarkable things that are just on the rise. And, uh, and, and, and so tap into that as well. Look at some of those films, some of those documentaries, and some of the creative ways in which our, some of our younger generation are bringing back culture in a powerful, creative way. I mean, thanks for all these presentations, they've been great. And to me, one of the themes of today and maybe earlier in the conference is storytelling and the ability to use stories to create yourself a place, tradition, link to culture. And there's a different type of story like Lovecraft and Campbell, and those authors were deeply racist. And those stories in the horror genre were taking us in a very different place towards otherizing other people. And so I guess my question is, what we really want to do is think about the stories we can tell together. And how do we do that? And how do we share those stories? And what are the stories that we should be talking about that actually promote and get people thinking about how we can imagine a different world and how we can promote the idea that we don't need to only ask the question of how do we survive, we need to move into this idea of how do we thrive, and what are the stories that you think that we couldn't be working on together? Mm -hmm. I, I can just, <laughs> it's hard to say what those stories might be, but I totally agree that that's where we need to move to, and I know that in my own writing, I went through this period of writing about my anxiety about climate change and how bad things could be, and I know that it's definitely time to move away from that, even if I'm still having those anxieties, that I need to move on to writing about what people are doing, what we could be doing, and to some of these positive stories, because we've got a population of people who are really concerned about climate change and don't know what to do. So people are ready to be given advice or, or um, tools to know what we all need to do collectively to move forward. And I've also noticed that publishers are looking for books like that right now. They are saying no to the doom and gloom books and they want positive stories of ways forward. Um, and I would hope to be able to contribute something to that in the future. Um, I think it's a really important thing to do. Hmm. It's a bit of a loaded question, um, but I think from a Māori Indigenous lens, we talk a lot about dynamic adaptation, um, so ka mua, ka muri, so we look to our past um, to walk into the future, so take the learnings of our past, um, you know, recognise and acknowledge that we've adapted over time to whatever challenges um, we face. Um, I think also from our world view and how we're raised and how we raise our children is that we have an intergenerational lens. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't want to simplify it, but, um, you know, always have that optimism um, and that hope that, um, well, not hope, that optimism that, you know, we're amazing human beings um, and we can adapt. Um, but we all need to do this together. It's not just Indigenous people, not, you know, um, we actually, it needs to be community efforts. I think like in any relationship, no matter who you are or how old you are, you have to build that trusting bond in order to be able to partner 
on projects or whatever the case may be. And because we've had such a history in our own world, you know, with Greenpeace that in their own, uh, and the animal rights movement in their own emotional stances on at protecting animals really with a broad stroke really did a number on our world in the Arctic. Uh, and we're still trying today to build back those relationships that, ex that, that really were severed and that created pov further poverty and, and wounding in our world. So I think the start to any relationship and building and, and having projects together is to build that, um, that respectful um, bond and trust. And if you could learn more about, you know, indigenous writing, there's a lot of indigenous writers today, by the way, uh, you know, on so many issues that if some of them resonate with you and, and even some people in our communities that are working on science uh, and who are becoming scientists in their own right uh, through universities as well in our own world, it's to to reach out to, 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 to those that you think um, are worth your while and time as well, but we also are very guarded <laughs> with who we partner with because we've been so dismissed for so long that it's important for us to tell our stories from our own perspectives. And the way in which I find this helpful is help to elevate those voices. That would be an incredible start, is to help to elevate those voices that have been so uh, dismissed for so long and minimized. And that would be a start to creating that, those trusting relationships and, and, then work, and then moving on to create. Well, you know, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, that's a long time ago, was building those kinds of, of relationships. And then, you know, politics got in the way afterwards. And those were the, the days of the Bush administration. And we thought that was challenging. Um, but, you know, it's, there's, um, there are ways in which these can be done. And there are movements that are happening. It's not to suggest that it's not, but start, again, it starts with self. You know, what is my intent? What's my intention in, in, in wanting to partner with others? Or, and, and is it authentic? Is it real? Is it respectful? And uh, let's, let's listen to those voices that have been so, um, you know, wounded for so long that you can respect that, uh, trying to move forward. Um, I did an interview with a magazine, Sun magazine, which is a US literary magazine, and it was about the importance of hope in the climate crisis. And I found myself talking about a lot of things about um, community action and collective action and public goods. And all these words, I realized, were really triggering for an American because they basically think that I'm talking about communism. And um, it was really interesting because a lot of the... the the solutions do involve real, you know, working together. And so it's, yeah, it can be challenging to think about how you talk about those things to an audience that's going to be triggered by the word community. But, yeah, hopefully that's just the United States, is it? <laughs> that's a great variety of everyone in the United States. <laughs> no, sure, sure. Certain groups within... <laughs> But, but what, I, what I guess I'm saying is that um, an American idea of community or even the word socialism is different from what that means where I live. Yeah. I've got one question tying into the last one. Um, if we look at contemporary literature and arts in general, I wonder whether you could reflect on how it has changed and is changing um, with in, t in terms of the portrayal of Antarctica and the science um, that is conducted from there and in there with um, respect to the NSF or BAS having dedicated artists and writers programs, um, scientists turning writers, and also with increased numbers of tourists um, and them potentially writing afterwards. I wonder whether you could reflect of how the literary landscape or maybe art landscape in general has changed since these programs have launched? I don't know about the programs myself. I could only say a tiny bit about this. I think it was maybe, oh, someone 30 or 40 years ago said that, you know, there is no Antarctic literature um, because the only literature there was really speculative from people who'd imagined Antarctica rather than been there. But now we have a whole lot of... Um, 
fiction and non-fiction by writers who have been to Antarctica, and Kim Stanley Robinson's work is, is an obvious one, and his, his work is science fiction, but it's very grounded in um, science facts, and you can even um, recognise certain Antarctic scientists here today who, who appear as fictionalised characters in his work. Um, do you have more to say about this, Rob? Um, I, I think there's there's a lot more to be done. Um, I think the it, it's it's sort of in the absence of, of more programs is a problem. It it, it works. I mean, it, it, money spent that way works, um, and um, it takes time. You know, I think people pull funding where they don't see results. Uh, and, and the results they, they think can be measured uh, in, uh, in readers, but sometimes it, it just takes time. And um, it, it reminds me of the affirmative action program in the States, to go back to politics in America, I'm sorry, but you know, um, it, it, there was r real results. People used to think that uh, existentialism didn't apply to, uh, to people who weren't white, and then Richard Wright comes along and writes The Outsider, and then people realize, okay, this is an international, multi-ethnic concern. And things like that are, are possible in communities in the polar regions. We just need to invest money and uh, really encourage as much community outreach as possible to encourage all forms of artistic response to um, climate change within communities in the polar regions. And it has to start there, and then it comes out, and it just takes time. Um, and that's about all I can say on that one. Are there any other burning questions? We've, we've held you captive for a while now. Any other questions while, while we have this uh, wonderful panel? How are you feeling, Rebecca? Are you good? Good. I just ask, does anyone want to have some final, final words? Do I? Hmm. <laughs> I've been grappling with jet lag and trying to get enough sleep at night here. Um, one of the things that I find um, that we haven't done enough of is, you know, the world is very big on entertainment. America is very big on entertainment, that there hasn't been enough of the wanting to reach out and understand and, and, and put some of these stories on screen, you know, where everybody goes to see documentaries and there's more and more, but the world, I think, should be partnering in that respect. I think that would be very helpful uh, for people and the younger generation to see, you know, the imagery of the Arctic and, and the issues that we're dealing with in that way, I think can be very, very helpful. That's backed up by science in a way that's creative, you know? It can be very, um, I've often wondered why there hasn't, you know, you, you, go, you have all of it, you have the Moana from, from New Zealand, you know? I don't know how you think of that, um, but you've got that from all over the world, but you've ne we've never seen anything from the North or the Arctic on the wisdom that comes from that place and to be depicting it in a creative way that children can start to, to understand. Because, you know, there's a story I heard before um, why the animal rights movements were so big in certain parts of, the, of Europe, like France, for example, because children were watching these cartoons about how horrific all of this stuff was, and they would be watching that since very young. And so they were brainwashed into thinking that this is a horrific thing that's happening in Canada and other places on indigenous lands. So we can shift the way in which we start to train or educate the younger generation to see and feel differently about these issues if we start them young. And, uh, and that's just one thing that sometimes has often come to my mind is in terms of there should be more really powerful documentaries uh, that are being made that includes the wisdom of the hunters and the wisdom of scientists that work together to address these issues. Thank you. Thanks very much again to the panel. Just a, a, another um, show of thanks to the uh, for our speakers and panelists.
very much appreciated. Now, um, my understanding is that